welcome. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction and then, and then we'll ease into what I call subperiod one. I came along at a very fortunate time for me. Uh, when I was a junior in college, Sputnik one went up. I could see the handwriting on the wall. There was going to be lots of money and opportunity for science teachers. Switched my major from history to science, got on that particular bandwagon and have never regretted it. Got a free master's degree from Syracuse University and a free doctorate from the University of Wisconsin. My entrance to Wisconsin was in, in a, was via an institute for science supervisors. When I got there, classes had not yet started. I found my way into the library. In the library, I came across a book by Harry Passow called Curriculum Crossroads. One of the chapters in the book was by Arthur Fauché. It was titled Characteristics of a True Discipline. In that chapter, Fauché said that every true discipline contains an area of concern, or what he called a domain, that everyone was in agreement upon. Yes, this is history. Yes, this is mathematics. It's not something else. Additionally, every true discipline contains a set of methods or rules of procedure that everyone is in agreement with. This is how you do historical research. This is how you solve a certain kind of chemical equation. Thirdly, and Fauché said most importantly, was a history. Why was the history important? Because it was from the history that the domain, domain evolved, that the set of rules or procedures coalesced from. So over time, we produce a domain, a set of rules. The great historian of science was a fellow by the name of George Sarton. George said, no one should be recognized the master in any subject that does not know at least the outline of its history. Ellsworth Oburn was a curriculum person. He said the past is an ever-present foundation upon which a future must be built. Ernst Mach had a lot to do with discovering the speed of sound, hence the speed of sound is called Mach 1, two times the speed of sound, Mach 2, and on and on. He was translated by a fellow named McCormick into English, and in that particular book, Ernst said, and beware, this is kind of complicated reading. They that know the entire course of the development of science will, as a matter of course, judge more freely and more correctly of the significance of any present scientific movement than they, who limited in their views to the age in which their own lives have been spent, contemplate merely the momentary trend that the course of intellectual events takes at the present moment. Very complicated way for saying what Sarton has already told us. Herbert Klebard was one of my professors at Wisconsin. He taught the curriculum course and said, each generation is left to discover anew the persistent and perplexing problems that characterize the field. Now, I picked that quote because I knew Herb Klebard and because I liked his alliteration, persistent and perplexing problems kind of sticks with you. Arlo Bellac, another curriculum person, said, to say that the contemporary curriculum problems have historical roots is to be guilty of a commonplace. But given the pervasive ahistorical posture of the curriculum field, it is a truism that curriculum specialists would do well to keep in mind. Uh, about that ahistorical, if you put a in front of a word, it means without. So ahistorical means no history. Butts and Kremen in their book on curriculum again say educational policies and decisions look both forward and backward. Whenever judgments are made, they rest upon some assumption or presuppositions about the past, as well as some hope or preference about the future. 
A careful study of history is therefore an indispensable element in evaluating the present and in making plans for the future. You've all heard of Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, Kurt wrote some crazy books, uh, probably Slaughterhouse Five is his most uh, famous. He also wrote uh, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, Breakfast of Champions, and a number of others. He, he wrote really squirrely stuff. So if you want to read something wacko, read Kurt Vonnegut. In the introduction to John Birmingham's Our Time is Now, that was a collection of vignettes from underground high school newspapers, Vonnegut wrote the preface. And he said, when you get to be our age, you all of a sudden realize that you are being ruled by people you went to high school with. You all of a sudden catch on that life is nothing but high school. You make a fool of yourself in high school. Then you go to college to learn how you should have acted in high school. Then you go out into real life, and that turns out to be high school all over again. Class officers, cheerleaders, and all. And I think the thing that set Vonnegut off here is when he realized that his wife had gone to high school with Melvin Laird. Now, you historians will know who Melvin is. Melvin Laird was Richard Nixon's Secretary of Defense. And the cartoonists loved him because he was bald. And when they drew him, they drew his head as an atomic bomb exploded. Easing on. Not Herbert. Gosh, I forgot Krug's last her first name now. Edward. I'm so sorry, Edward. Edward Krug wrote, No matter what winds of doctrine, doctrine swirled about the loftier altitudes of the NEA, the local high school sat solidly on its allotted ground, ready to open each, each August or September with classes to be held, and another nine months of daily routine ahead. Its teachers responded slowly to the various cosmic missions set forth by critics. Most of the time, they simply did what seemed to be their work. The nature of this work was defined by the doing. I present this quote not because I'm pushing high school on you, but because no matter what level of education you happen to be at, Elementary, secondary, college, post-college. When the door is closed, most teachers teach what they know and do best, regardless of what lofty pronouncements come down upon them from above. Okay, here we are. I think you've discovered by now that the uh, when I make a mistake, I will correct it immediately and not go back and start the slide over again. So expect some honest glitches along the way. We are now in sub-period one. Well, actually, we're not now in sub-period one. This is just a, uh, a sneak preview. We've, I've divided the course into seven sub-periods. The first one begins in antiquity and goes until 1788 starts with the earliest foundations of education. These are written records, and it begins with the success of the academy movement in the United States. Subperiod two begins with Franklin's Academy, that's Ben Franklin, and it ends with the rise of the three public high schools. It extends from uh, approximately 1750 to 1850. Subperiod three begins with the first public high school and ends when the high schools surpass the academies in popularity from about 1820 to 1890. Subperiod four is taken directly from Edward Krug's book, The Shaping of the American High School. Subperiod 5, 1918 to 1941, begins with the Cardinal Principles Report and ends with the Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor. Subperiod 6 starts with Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia 
and finishes up with the launching of Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union. Subperiod 7, mounting criticism of life adjustment education in and around 1954-ish, extends until 1972, which was the last full year of Vietnam prior to the Watergate break-in and then the Watergate uh, blow-up that came in the wake of that. We really don't have a subperiod eight, but if we did, I would begin it in 1970 with the bombing of the University of Wisconsin's Mathematic Research Mathematics Research Center. Uh, that seemed to signify an end to the campus violence that uh, was going on during the 1960s. I say as we speak for the ending and the ending in question marks because I don't know whether we've had one or two subperiods since that time have not have not worked any further. Perhaps uh, one of you enterprising folks will will jump in and perhaps continue this. In the meantime, let's continue on. Let's continue on.